So let's understand fitting protocol. It's, it's quite simple, patient selection. So you know this patient is suitable for a rigid material and not for unsuitable for a soft contact lens material, soft contact lens. So patient selection and counseling is very crucial. One of the key things that I would like to observe here is I would not proceed with the trial until and unless the patient himself or herself is ready for the trial. Frequently, I've seen, you know, the patient is not willing, but the parents are more than willing to fit contact lenses to the patient. And that happens frequently in India, especially for marriage reasons and sadly so. So uh, my rule is until and unless the person who's going to wear the contact lens, if they are ready, I proceed with the trial or I keep on counseling till, till they become ready. Pre-fitting evaluation, which includes your uh, HVIDs, VVIDs, uh, TO function tests, your keratometry, your corneal topography, slit lamp examination. So all that you have to do and document because this helps you to decide what material, what kind of lens design, what should be the diameter of the lens, what should be the curvature of the base curve. Then finally, based on these, when you get a get a first trial trial lens, you put the lens in the patient's eye, then you conduct a complete trial and do the fit assessment. And once the fit assessment is over, you can modify the fit either empirically or proceed with the second trial lens and finalize your prescription. So in pre-fitting evaluation, slit lamp examination is a must. You need to check the lids, you need to check the cornea, conjunctive or TO film, how much of debris is there in the in the TOs. Do your TO function test, your TPUTs. So all these are very, very important. These are basics and I would not really go into the details of it. Uh, if you have a keratometer, make sure it is, it is well calibrated because Based on these keratometry readings, you're going to decide on the contact lens parameters. So frequently, maybe every three months, every six months, calibrate the keratometer. I've seen that many people use keratometer, but they don't understand or they don't know how to calibrate the instrument. So that should not be the case. Or if you have corneal topography, make sure you uh, get into the habit of capturing good topography maps and again, calibrate the instrument every six months. HVID in pupil would help you to determine the initial diameter of the RGB lens and the optic zone diameter. And ocular plane refraction would give you an idea about what should be the PAR. So uh, one screenshot of how to proceed base curve is dependent on the flat K whenever we are talking about corneal RGBs. See, although I did say in the, in the beginning of my presentation that this will be covering all the RGP contact lenses, whether it is corneal or scleral or ortho K, right? But some of these slides are limited to corneal RGPs because that is where we make a start. That is where we begin your begin our uh, RGP contact lens practice. So if it is going to be a corneal RGP, then the base curve is got by the flat K reading, okay? And you go slightly steeper than the flat K reading when there is astigmatism. How much steeper? I'll tell you in the subsequent slides. Total diameter is got by the formula HVID minus two. Please remember these are the starting parameters and they would change as you see the fitting on the slit lamp. Optic zone diameter could be pupil diameter plus 1.2 or 1.5 millimeters because we want the optic zone to cover pupil from all 360 degrees. And cornea plane refraction would give you the power of the RGP contact lens. So, uh, you need to, I mean, this is my method. I go one third steeper for, uh, one third steeper than the flat K when it comes to astigmatism. So if you have one diopter of astigmatism, I would go 0.33 diopter steeper than the flat K. If you have three diopters of astigmatism, I would go one diopter steeper than the flat K. But of course, if you have access to toric RGPs, then three diopter astigmatism would need a toric RGP. But this is my rule of thumb. And the rule of thumb would differ from books to books, but almost it will be close. If you see the bottom picture, this was <clears throat> a toric scleral contact lens fitting that we were attempting. So first is the base curve, the central fit of the lens. This is very, very important. This is where we begin and then we go towards the periphery. So the ideal fluorescein pattern would differ depending on what kind of lens you're fitting, whether it's a corneal RGP or it's an ortho-K lens or it's a scleral contact lens. So in a corneal RGP, we would like to see an alignment fit. If it is the orthokeratology lens, then we need to see the bullseye kind of uh, fluorescein pattern. And if it's a scleral contact lens, then we need to see a vaulting of about 200 to 250 microns. 
but one thing is very sure if there is too much of pooling in the center then we need to flatten the base curve if there is too much of bearing in the center then we need to steepen the base curve so we should be familiar with the term pooling and bearing pooling is when you have excess fluorescein in the center as uh, seen in the picture or uh, bearing is in a dark area where you don't see fluorescein at all <clears throat> so the rule of thumb here is 0.05 uh, millimeter change in the back optic zone radius is equivalent to 0.25 diopter change in the power. So if you're making a change in the base curve, let's uh, see the example given at the bottom. Uh, you have a patient wherein the vision is good, but the base curve appears to be steeper. So you need to flatten. Now, when the base curve is steep, you have excess fluorescein here, which means you've got excess of uh, positive tear lens, right? So when you flatten the base curve, the positivity of the tear lens reduces and it becomes more myopic. So what is the correlation? If you flatten it by one step, then you need to add a plus 0.25 to the power because you need to reduce the minus power also. And that is, it, it's very easy for us to remember by the acronyms FAP and SAM rule or SAM and FAP rule. So flat add plus. So if you're going flatter on the base curve, you add plus power to the power. And if you're going steeper on the base curve, then you add minus power to your contact lens prescription. Okay. Diameter, I told you the initial selection of diameter depends upon the HVID. So HVID minus 2 millimeters or minus 2.5 millimeters, as some books would say. But this has to be eventually modified based on the dynamic fitting of the contact lens on the patient's cornea. So if the lens is lagging down with every blink, the lens goes up but falls down completely and it is, it is decentered, inferiorly decentered, then you might want to increase the diameter so that the upper lid could hold the edge and pick it up, right? So fitting by the cob technique or lid attachment technique. If the lens is riding too high, you need to release it from the lid by reducing the diameter. So depending on your HVID, depending on the power, depending on how thick the lens is at the edge, you might want to increase or decrease the diameter. And please remember, changing of the diameter has maximum effect on the fit. So the rule of thumb here is 0.5 millimeter increase in the diameter is equivalent to 0.05 millimeters increase in the base curve radius to get the same fluorescein pattern. So sometimes, you know, you're happy with the fit, but the diameter is small and you want to increase it, or the diameter is too large and you want to reduce it because you don't want the limbal stem cells to get disturbed. So when you're reducing the diameter, you're making the lens fit flatter. So corresponding change has to be done in the base curve radius. So if the lens has become flatter and you want to steepen the base curve radius, so you'll have to reduce 0.05 millimeter in the base curve radius. Edge lift should be about 0.5 millimeters of nice 360 degrees band. It should not be too dark. If it is too dark, we know it's flat. If it is too light or if it is showing bearing in the periphery, we know that the edge lift is non-existent, right? So it should be optimum. Now, what is optimum? I would suggest you go onto the internet and find out uh, what are the fluorescein patterns edge related and which is optimum, which is one diopter flat, which is two diopter flat. You can easily get all these pictures on the net. So either you do that or you order a lens, uh, maybe three lenses for a patient, optimum edge lift and one diopter flatter edge lift and two diopters flatter edge lift and see for yourself. Now, if the edge lift is not proper, it affects the comfort. Uh, it affects the three and nine o'clock staining. Then uh, <clears throat> tear exchange and centration. So we start with the corneal plane refraction. So corneal plane refraction basically uh, gives you just the idea about what kind of power the lens should have. But frequently we have trial lenses in varying powers and most often they are in minus threes and minus fives. So you put the lens in the patient's eye, do a quick over refraction, and if there is a little bit of cylinder, then you can do a spherical uh, equivalent calculation. Or if there is too much of cylinder, then we know we need a bitoric lens. So based on your original fitting uh, power of the lens and your over refraction, you can calculate what should be the final prescription. Make sure if the power is in excess of four diopters, then you use vertex distance calculator.